Welcome to Gaining the Technology Leadership Edge, a podcast for tech executives. We provide strategies and tactics to help executives succeed and further their career goals. With interviews from industry experts, leaders, and innovators, this show will surely get you on the edge of your seat with thought-provoking advice on how to stay ahead of the competition. Welcome to Gaining the Technology Leadership Edge, a podcast exploring the latest trends, strategies, and insights in technology leadership. We'll discuss the most important topics and ideas shaping the industry today, from emerging technologies to digital transformation and beyond. Join us to learn all the juicy secrets of tech leaders, their biggest successes and failures, uh, on our quest for gaining that all-important technology edge. Are you ready? Let's get started. So today, my guest is Jeremy Lastman. Jeremy is the founder and CEO of the Passion Company, love the name, by the way, um, a pioneering public utility addressing the universal basic human needs for passion. Their mission is to use his invention of imagination technology to accelerate the world's conscious evolution to superhuman. Jeremy is also a former SpaceX technologist who assisted the CIO and most notably worked with Elon Musk to create a music video commemorating the company's first successful launch. After leaving SpaceX, Jeremy developed the groundbreaking superhero franchise, Mania. He has a bachelor's degree in business administration with an emphasis in entrepreneurship from Chapman University. Welcome to the show, Jeremy. Thank you for having me. Nice to be here, Mike. Ah, That's a great bio, by the way. Um, So tell me what you're up to. Well, like you said, we are, uh, I've got a big vision for what... uh, I feel will serve humans as we really advance our technology edge, uh, as your podcast name uh, is, and really what it will take uh, for our species to stay current with how fast and accelerated um, these developments and uh, you know innovations that are going to be happening uh, for us to stay uh, current in evolution. In, in really staying advanced ourselves as a, as a human species. And I, I bring this by really bringing together and, and really taking the metaphor uh, that you know, a human being uh, is an advanced piece of technology in how our minds, our body and our spirit, this imagination technology all together and really addressing it as what is the fuel of human energy when we really look at it, and that is passion. So everything that we're doing with the Passion Company is to clean, train, refine the fuel so that a human being's imagination technology can perform and accelerate as we uh, collaborate with technology advancing. So what role do you think passion plays in all of that? Well, when you really, Uh, immerse yourself that it is the fuel of human energy, then we can really start to address some of the problems uh, that arise when a fuel is not running, you know, to its highest performance or when it's getting bottlenecked. These are things like stress, anxiety, pain, all these things. When you look at it in the metaphor or in the, in the story, that is a fuel, you can more precisely address the, upgrading the the leveling up of of how this fuel is running throughout our whole system that's interesting you call that you refer to as fuel as well because you know i'm not sure if everybody thinks of it this way but like i'll say you know like in i've been on like kind of a two-year weight loss journey and i'll tell people you know food is just fuel for me you know i just it keeps me going and i think stress is fuel i think anger is fuel it fuels you in wrong directions but it's fuel you know pushes you in wrong directions so it's really interesting that you refer to it that way because i'd never actually i mean when you said it it was like oh it makes sense but mm-hmm. i'd never actually like cognitively thought about that um mm-hmm. yeah you know, and went ah oh, let me think about this but that that's a very interesting point um and i also think passion is something that drives i agree with you that it drives all that because if you're passionate about something you'll pretty much do whatever it takes to make it happen. Um, And if you're not passionate about something, it doesn't matter what someone threatens you with, you pretty much won't make it happen. So I really do see passion as kind of the ultimate, like the jet fuel behind everything, you know, makes everything happen. Um, 
So, so tell me a little bit about um, what got you started with founding the passion company. Like what was the impetus for that? Well, the impetus really was I had been in like a deep research and development with how to take my imagination, take my invention of imagination technology and really apply it into a, an area of the world or uh, in our life that could be of maximum benefit and, and the biggest vision for, um, yeah, ha, ha, playing playing the biggest game really uh, and, and not thinking small, not you know trying to hide anything. And what really focused that was looking at, okay, what are our current basic human needs and how have they arisen in the infrastructure, the supply and the support uh, to, to, to where we are today? And we water, gas, electricity, uh, power, right? Like these are all the basic human needs that we've laid monumental infrastructure uh, to deliver clean water, uh, to have electricity, uh, instant gratification electricity. Um, and so when I took that fuel metaphor that we talked about uh, into, okay, well, what does that look like when passion is the basic human need here? And so what we're doing is, is I see a vision in, uh, in creating a, a whole new utility sector uh, for passion side by side with water, gas, and electricity, not only to support it, like I said, but really supplying it, uh, if that makes sense. And that might seem, you know, a little out there for some people, but when you really consider the consuming of, of data, the consuming of entertainment, uh, the, the uh, information, we're really this is energy that we're, we're we're consuming in that sense. So we're taking uh, really cool innovations and approaches to what it would what it's like in a, on an inventing sense, innovation sense, to supply the cleanest passion on the planet uh, through everything that my invention is doing and and the application of it and uh, thinking what this support is, what, what tech support for the soul could be like when it's brought down to a utility level uh, to humanity. I, I think people have to understand, uh, like you made a great comment there about people think it's strange, unusual, whatever. And I think people need to set aside those kind of judgments at first, because I mean, pretty much every technological advancement has been looked on with like, huh, you know, that's an odd thing. Who would have ever thought of that? Um, and that's kind of the point, right? <laughs> no one thought of it. Now someone has. Let's see what it can do. Exactly. Um, and I think having an open mind is really important and assuming good intentions about what they're trying to accomplish. Um, too many people, I mean, I, I think if life in general and the pandemic specifically taught, teaches us anything, it's that sometimes the strangest things are actually true, you mm -hmm. know, um, and it's, the only reason you don't know about them already is because no, someone hadn't discovered it yet or invented it yet. Um, and I mean, look at the iPhone, you know, they're everywhere now. Um, and I can remember I've had iPhone since the first one. And the only reason I had one since the first one is because I'm a technical guy. I love yep. technology and I jumped right in. And yeah, there was a lot of headaches with it early on. Um, there's even some now, but it's, I could actually go on the road and run my entire business from my little tiny phone, you know, I mean, like, I know <laughs> I have the big iPhone. So I know people think it's like this monster, but still, it's just a tiny phone. I don't have to bring like this giant laptop with me everywhere I go. I could take that phone in it. It just does the job. Point being innovation, right? If you define innovation the way Steve Jobs did, it was giving people something that they didn't know they needed. And there you go. If you don't know you need something and you're presented with it, you're going to say, oh, that's weird. I don't think that's really a bright idea give it a shot, you know, let it, let it happen. Right. Yeah. So, so what is that? That was weird. Um, tell me about, uh, your time at SpaceX. Mm. Everybody's going to be interested in that. <laughs> yes. Well, I was there, um, 
Oh, I just have one response to what you just said, if that's okay. Like yeah. the, the other quote that came up was the Arthur, Arthur C. Clarke quote, right? Like any advanced technology is like indistinguishable from magic, right? Yeah. That That's such a inspiration there. Um, but yes, uh, SpaceX, I was there when it was a startup um, in that like, uh, I was like employee 110 uh, around oh, that. Oh, wow. Area. Real early. Uh, that early, yeah, and um, so I got to be there at the ground floor of the incredible atmosphere of like seeing a you know rocket attempts and the rocket being built in a factory and um, being in the midst of uh, the engineers and the, the rocket scientists and I was you know the outskirts IT uh, IT department you know supporting the tech uh, bugs and the servers and, um, that sort of thing. Uh, and, uh, just electric, I, the, the atmosphere, the, um, you know, when we had that first successful launch, the excitement, uh, the his, it was just being part of history when, when you really consider that no company had really done that before. It was all governments and countries. Uh, so the scope and the vision, multi-planetary species, landing rockets back then was unheard of uh and just seeing all the all the naysayers all the doubters the skeptics and just every single mark even if it was a little delayed like success everything got proven wrong in that sense um so just a huge inspiration for me uh as a younger uh person and um just getting that opportunity uh to be there and and show my stuff, uh, I couldn't have asked for a better like first job sort of thing. <laughs> That's great because you you were put into an environment of of innovation, um, and it got you to think in that in that manner from an earlier or early age. And I think that's um, unfortunately one of the problems we have today is kids. Everything is instant gratification, and so they they kind of. Um, they don't have the patience to like sit down, figure something out and, and then move on. I mean, my, I, I get on my own daughter sometimes and she's 21 years old and I'll say, why did your email address change for like the 50th time this year? Oh, I forgot my password. So you didn't set up a backup email address to get your recovery. No, do it the next time. Okay, dad. And then the next time it changes again there because they just don't have the they don't have the passion to go and do that. They just, ah, it's easier. I'll just create another email address. It's not that important to me anyway. But it also kind of tells you how society as a whole is changing because they're really more into the quick text message than sending an email. Mm -hmm. um, so their email address, it's not that important to them. They're right. using it to collect receipts from companies that they're buying things they from. They're not really using it to communicate, which I find interesting, actually. Um I can remember when faxes were a thing, you know, now we don't even, gosh, I mean, now you, you fax by taking a picture on your phone and sending it to them. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think, I think it ties back to that passion thing. If they don't have the passion for it, they're just not going to care. And since email is not important to them, what do I care if I change to me? If I changed my email 50 times in a year, I'd be out of business. People wouldn't be able to find me. Uh, it's just kind of crazy. So what, what would you say is like your, the, the most memorable project that you've worked on? Well, I think you you read it in the bio, uh, and I, I I do I do agree that that is the most notable one. So yeah, it was. Um, I want to put your put put the audience you in in the in the in the time right. Like we're we're looking at a time when the only kind of space stuff was really NASA, uh, and they were at that tail end of the space shuttle kind of dying out, or mm -hmm. or you know what I mean. So the public perception of space exploration was at like an all time low, I would say. Um, and we were trying to change, we were trying to, you know, ignite the public's excitement again, right? And we had this line back then of like, we needed to be taken seriously, but we're also trying to make this fun because we're dealing with, governments and like these, you know, regulations of international, like uh, ITAR, international relation, relations of tech I, uh, IP and, and all of that stuff, right? So there was a lot of carefulness uh, with that. Um, but we had just had our first successful 
launch. Uh, it was uh, Falcon 1 uh, Flight 4 or 3, I believe. And uh, Elon had the idea of let's do a, a music video to like commemorate the the huge historic success. And he picked a song. It was a Crystal Method High Roller song, uh, uh, High Roller Crystal Method. Um, and I was tasked with you know constructing and editing the the music video with all the camera feeds that we had and on board and the launch uh, thing and the the sound. Uh, but again, it was dancing that line of like, it had to be kind of professional and, and not super out there for the time that we were doing this. Um, and I got to do that and Elon's feedback to make it the best we could be. And yeah, uh, so I got to work with him, you know, one-on-one -on -one with that. Uh, and it was an incredible uh, opportunity to do that. That's really cool. I, I, I think that when you, it was important to kind of put it into perspective of the time because um people people then were you know like it was after the whole space shuttle stuff and i think people were sort of fatigued by all of that and so to get the excitement up that's really cool um well, that's fun i mean I, I i know it's always fun to look back on things like that and and kind of relive it in your head but what would you say is the most difficult project you work on that maybe if you had it to do over again you would have skipped <laughs> Uh, oh, I don't know if I would have skipped it, uh, but in terms of like an in, the most intense thing uh, that, that I was tasked with <laughs> uh, was um, we had headquarters in El Segundo um, and we had outgrown those offices. And then we had, we built, uh, found new headquarters in Hawthorne, which is maybe about uh, like, 20 minutes, 15, 20 minutes away uh, in terms of drive. And Elon, of course, in the intensity was like, I don't want any downtime on our servers, on, on anything, you know, yeah. the, the huge ask, right? Yeah. So basically, 100% uptime. Right. 100% <laughs> uptime, even when we're moving headquarters. Um, so basically, it was an all night uh, moving company, disassembling servers, loading them in the truck. And then reassembling oh, oh, the same night, uh, headquarter to headquarter, um, it, intense. It was a blast, but that was that was uh, that was crazy. That was a crazy night. You know, it's funny you say that because I, I I actually worked for a restaurant <laughs> delivery service, and they took uh -huh. a lot of orders overnight uh -huh. um, for corporate events. And when we were moving from one location to another, the CEO is like, "Now, of course, those orders are going to continue to be able to come in, right?" Uh -huh. And I said, well, um, no, the website's going to be down while I move it. And so he was like, no, that's not acceptable. We can't do that. So I said, well, if you can get me access to the computer room in the other location early, I have mm -hmm. an idea. And I just literally, um, I knew that the web server was probably like at half its life and it was going to need to be repurposed anyway. So I rebuilt a new web server put it in place at the new place. And all I did was flip the DNS switch, you know, and point it to the correct um, IP address. And then it, new locations running, old location can be shut down. And I just repurposed the other web server for something, for another server, you know, another yeah. server's purpose that maybe didn't need as much um, bang for the buck, you know? Um, but, but yeah, it's funny how people, they, 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 I want, I don't want any downtime. Never. <laughs> you should Never. always be up. 100%. I would get like AT&T's internet connection would go down. Why are we down? Why can't you fix it? I'm not AT&T. I can't, you know, I can't do anything about that. Yeah. That's really interesting. Um, it sounds like um, working at SpaceX, it kind of taught you to be like um, more forward thinking, more open-minded. Is that correct? Yes, I, I, I would definitely say so. Just being in that, like the orbit of his intensity, his passion, um, and, and also just, being um, kind of a, uh, a a sensitive people pleaser growing up uh, to see how he was the opposite of that. Like he didn't care about people's feelings uh, in, in that way. Like gave me that contrast of like, oh yeah, I don't have to be so afraid of ruffling people's feathers or saying the wrong thing. Uh, I do feel like there's a middle ground. Uh, it, you know, I, I didn't go full asshole <laughs> in that sense, but like, yeah. Uh, in terms of what it taught me, you know, in business and professional life, like, uh, you know, efficiency. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think, 
I, I think sometimes people um they don't they don't see what their past has done for their present you know hmm. um like the experiences that you've had like at spacex and probably other jobs that you've done have kind of shaped your thinking for this new for this new company that you founded mm -hmm. um and that's um you know that's a really um important thing for people to remember and like my clients tend to they they'll they'll talk poorly about past jobs and then i'll say but surely there must have been something um you um got out of that yes yes i totally agree um, well, tell me what, what are, what are the plans for the future? Like, where do you hope for this, for, to take the passion company? Yeah, the, the, the vision is, is certainly big. Uh, I, I feel in the, in the scope of how it can be, you know, taken into businesses and corporations into, um, government like level kind of, uh, understanding and application I, I i do feel the the service the the like if we're talk if we're talking on the level and the language of utility uh and next to water and gas <laughs> and these other utility sectors uh we're talking a very very big scope of 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 where it can go um and and yeah the, the, it's big that's that that's going to be an interesting push though right like mm -hmm. what what kind of pushback are you getting on that from um say other businesses maybe other industries that's a good question i think it's in terms of my evolution as an entrepreneur um it really has come down to like communication um because it is an out there concept. Um, and I've really had to experiment in the, the R and D behind this to, to find the language and to go on podcasts like this and to, to share it and put it out there. Uh, that's, that's really been the evolution I feel. And the, I think the pushback is just misunderstanding or just not understanding, you know, the, the capability or the like, why, uh, and, um, and that, that, and I feel like that is being addressed and, and I've gotten so much better, uh, in communication and in marketing, uh, with, with, you know, the help of my team uh, and all, all of the things to, um, take it out of my head and out of the kind of like lone wolf, you know, dreamer, uh, quality and to put it out there, to get it out, to keep refining the message, um, and, uh, and the communication I feel has been the, the theme, uh, to answer your question with that. So like, I, I think of people like you as visionary because you're coming up with something that, um, hasn't necessarily been addressed, you know, at all. Um, yeah. and when that happens, how comfortable are you, have you been like relinquishing some control to your team so that they can make some of the decisions? It's gotten, yeah, it's gotten so much better. I think, did you, I think you read in the bio that I had done like a comic book uh, before. And that was like my first kind of artistic endeavor as a, as a, as a having a vision and a concept. And uh, that was the first time that I actually had that, like, wow, yes, I need help. Like, I can't, I can't do this by myself. Um, and, and play that out and really got to see the, the trust in a team dynamic um and I, I i wouldn't i would never kind of go back because i think the, the delegation uh and the trust and having all the talent around you that that can complement you know your weaknesses um and what i'm not designed or uh good at and and having that self awareness right that yes I, i'm i'm kind of a, a big picture guy and the details really don't you know, hold my, you know, you're not holding your attention. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's okay. Uh, I don't need to be good at everything or great at everything. Right. Um, and so I think that's, that's vitally important that you surround yourself with other people that, that 
are really passionate about the things that you're not passionate about uh, so that you can create something bigger than any one of the individuals, uh, including me. Uh, totally, totally. Yeah, and I think I think that's something that um, people in general can learn is understanding what you're passionate about and what you're good at and and being the best at that and then surrounding yourself with people who fill in the gaps that you're that you're missing i mean it's one of the reasons why like when you have a relationship with another person like a romantic relationship it's one of the reasons why if you're careful it'll work if you're if you're making sure you're picking somebody who um improves on your strengths i mean improves on your strengths but also fills in for your weaknesses you know someone who's supportive of things and so it's the same thing with your team one of the things i always tell my clients is empower your team members to make decisions um teach them where you're coming from let them know what the bottom line is like when i long long time ago i was a retail manager and it was during a time period when stores would post like their return policy on the wall and i used to tell my team it the second you feel the need to point to that sign you need to call a manager. Don't even bother pointing to the sign because now you're not being innovative with your solution for the customer. You're just being like, no, sorry, the sign says no one wants to hear that. Mm -hmm. um, but I empowered them to make the decision to give a refund in certain situations without seeking the manager because the manager ultimately has got to come in there and approve it. So right. I wasn't really worried, but but it made everything flow better. And I think it works the same way with a, with any corporation. If you're the CEO and your marketing director can't make decisions about where to spend his marketing budget without consulting you first, you've bootstrapped that person. You know, they no longer can actually do their job. But it also hurts you because now your 40 hours a week becomes 80 hours a week because now you're listening to his work and your work. Um, and it's, I don't know, it's just, uh, yeah, it's yeah. kind of a nightmare, you know? Yeah. And I would, you know, consider that the culture, the culture inside is is has to be the the role model or the the example of what it's like uh the 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 customer experience has to be what the the company culture is like of like we're putting out there the passion company and accelerating this conscious evolution to superhuman and so everyone of the internal culture is going to be that aim of the best performance of passion. Uh, and when that is aligned uh, and everyone is there in, in soul, uh, in, in body, mind, and soul completely and, and living that passion uh, in what they're doing, I don't think there's any better environment to play in because that's where the, the play and work are kind of like Use and you don't you don't know the the difference, right? Um, and as as an entrepreneur, business owner, whatever you want to call it, like that's the that's why I want a business. Like it, the money's cool, like right, like that's awesome. But I want the environment that it just feels like play every day with all the epic things that you're doing. Um, and and the company culture should be the example of like what the user experience uh is that you're putting out there no totally agree i i think um that is where a lot of startups fall apart um is the you know management's only thinking about themselves and not about their team um and they they don't teach the team how to make decisions that benefit the company and um so in the end they have to do it all and nobody really at that point nobody has any passion about the business itself because yeah. but why do i care if i if that guy's going to make all the decisions what the heck am i here for right i mean that's basically how employees think well I, that's really um intriguing to me so um th this whole concept is is intriguing to me actually um but so why i'm sure my listeners are going to feel the same way so why don't you let them know where they can find you yes yeah, so they can learn more about the passion company at uh universalimagination.org uh, that's the kind of the R and D behind everything that we're doing. Um, and, uh, there they can, um, learn more about imagination technology. They can try a, a five day demo, uh, of it. Um, and, uh, really th that's really 
the best way is you got to experience it uh, rather than me try to explain it because it is next generation technology uh, when you consider the, the implications to uh, your evolution, uh, your conscious evolution and, and really accelerating uh, to the next level uh, uh, as a species um, is what we're really talking about here. So I, if, if you're intrigued, uh, please reach out to, uh, we'd love to have a conversation. Um, if you're curious, uh, a curiosity call. Uh, we, we don't want it to just be all, uh, you know, automated, you know, headless. Uh, so we, if you're curious, please reach out. Um, we'd love to talk to you, demo, uh, see our products and services. Um, and yeah, I'd love for you to learn more. Excellent. Well, I'll make sure that that link gets into the um, show notes and the description of for the video. Perfect. Um, but, but again, thanks for being uh, on the show. I really appreciate your time. And it's Thank an you for having me. Topic. I love the questions, and I, I hope the audience got uh, some good value and change, and uh, no maybe some solutions uh, for them. Yeah, to no doubt, do their best. No doubt. Well, thanks yeah. for tuning in to the Gaining the Technology Leadership Edge podcast. We hope you've had a great time with us, learning everything you need to know. Stay ahead of the technology curve. Remember, be curious and be updated on all of the latest trends, and show them who's boss. Until next time. We'll be back with plenty more techie tips and tricks so you can stay on top of your game.